Let's turn to look at the global response to the crisis of biodiversity loss. So we are going to move on to look at the major treaties that were agreed in the early 1990s. So I'm going to look at the Rio conference and particularly focus on the Biodiversity Convention. And in later lectures, we'll look at the United, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the ongoing response to climate change. But this, this period of early 1990s is really a watershed in the overall international environmental regulatory system. So in outline, going to look at the Rio conference, the Earth Summit in 1992 briefly, and then mention the Rio Declaration, Agenda 21, and focus in this lecture on the Biodiversity Convention, so signed in 1992. So the context that we were looking at in the previous lectures was that, you know, this period of the 1980s to the 1990s, when there was really the, the uh, global concern for the environment was at its peak, and that was what laid the foundation and really built the momentum then spilling over into the early 1990s to the Earth Summit. It was really the culmination of everything that had happened in the previous decade and the lead up to it. And in many ways, 1992 marked the high water mark for the global response to the environment. And since then, there's been a lot of backtracking and a lot of the things that were agreed in 1992, if they were put up now, might well not, well actually not even might, but certainly wouldn't get the level of support and uh, number of parties that they did in that period. Like there's no way probably that the, I shouldn't say probably qualifications, there's simply no way that the US Senate would uh, rat approve ratification of something like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change it simply wouldn't happen. Yet the US did do that back in the early 1990s. So it was a different time. So in the early 1990s, I'm going to call it the modern period. I really mean it though in the sense that everything was in place. Everything that we, you know, if you look at the international regulatory system now in 2019, all of the main bits were really in place by 1992. So really after then, let's just call it the modern period. Uh, yeah, all the major environmental treaties were negotiated by then and the Rio summit in 1992 was critical. Climate change became a dominating concern during this period, but international progress gradually stalled after the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated in 1997. Global terrorism also became a major international driver after the September 11 attacks in 2001 and the US invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. We've also since then had the civil war in Syria and the humanitarian crisis from, that was caused by that and, and Europe and the rise and hopefully fall of ISIS, Islamic State. Uh, and also in this period, China emerges as a global superpower and industrial hub. I say there as US power wanes, uh, but you know, at the beginning of the 1990s, when the USSR fell apart, US was the sole superpower and they were triumphant in that. You know, it seemed like capitalism and democracy had won the day and would go on to you know, triumph over you know, all other political systems. And, you know, that um, it didn't fall apart in September 11, but certainly the US has squandered a huge amount of riches and political capital in, you know, in basically, uh, yeah, the terrorists in September 11 were incredibly successful in drawing the US into uh, unending wars in other places and generating ongoing hostility. It's like uh, such a terrible tragedy for the world. The global financial crisis occurred during this period too. So 2000, 2000, 2007 to 2008. And also there's been the EU debt crisis. Uh, so th these debt crises have been critical because during them essentially it gives a cover for people that don't want to take any action on addressing climate and environmental problems to say, oh, we can't do it now because jobs are at risk. We 
can't do it now because we can't afford it. And so the EU debt crisis, for instance, the EU has been one of the most consistent global leaders in addressing environmental issues. And so problems in Europe have big consequences for international action on environment. Uh, the European refugee crisis in 2014 to 2016 occurs. And again, because of the importance of the EU and Europe, that has big implications for the world. And it's, you know, that very much led to Brexit in 2016, which has so contaminated the ability of the EU to, to be a strong voice internationally because it's got its, you know, it's looking inward to, you know, the loss of one of the major partners in the whole European Union. And as well as that, the UK itself is, you know, is completely been consumed for the last few years in its own internal arguments about, you know, what is the UK? What does it mean? What should be its relationship with Europe? You think about all of the effort, the, the millions and millions of hours that have been wasted by you know, governments in addressing these issues when they could have actually been doing something useful and solving things like the climate crisis. Instead, we're stuck in this, you know, this maze that we can't seem to get out of. And also, momentum for global action on climate change has been rekindled uh, in the lead up to the Paris Agreement in 2015, led by the US and Obama. And I say this, Obama and the US were instrumental in rekindling that. So from where, really in 2009, where we'll talk about this in later lectures, we look at the evolution of the climate regime, but uh, 2009 was a disaster in Copenhagen. The, seemed like the world couldn't agree on what would replace the Kyoto Protocol and it was all going to, you know, no one could see a path forward. And it was Obama in his second term working with China. So the leadership in China was also instrumental in this and the partnership that they achieved in saying we need to address this better. And it was the US and China that led the world in agreeing in Paris in 2015 to, you know, take stronger action. And yes, I'm going to say it's inadequate and yes, we still, you know, have great difficulties, but we need to also recognise the successes. We need to recognise when things have taken a turn for the better and it was certainly a big turn for the better. Of course, um, since Obama, uh, the, yeah, the Trump administration has tried to basically destroy anything that Obama achieved. It seems to be this hang up of the current president that anything that Obama achieved is something that he's got to destroy for some sort of ego trip. Uh, and so Trump has indicated and in, in just last month the US actually deposited its instrument to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, it's certainly severely hampering global momentum to address climate change, but it hasn't stopped it, but it's certainly a big lead weight in progress. Okay, so that's the political context. Let's go then to Rio, and the time is 1992, so Rio de Janeiro, does anyone, has anyone been to Rio? Yay. Does anyone know what Rio de Janeiro means? It sounds like, you know, to an English speaker like me, it sounds like such an exotic name, Rio de Janeiro. It's amazing, like so exotic. Does anyone know what it actually means? And how it came to be named Rio de Janeiro? River the river of, yep, so Rio is river. So who's good with their Portuguese or the Spanish, the Portuguese? De Janeiro is January. And the whole city gets its name from the fact that European explorers, Portuguese, traveling south along the east coast of uh, what's now South America, uh, came across this massive river in January and they named it the January River. So what sounds so exotic has such a sort of prosaic origin. So the January River in Brazil. And uh, as you, you know, this is a famous picture of um, Rio with uh, the big statue of Christ the Redeemer overlooking the city. So a very religious uh, connotations. So, as you know, Rio de Janeiro is located in Brazil on the east coast of um, South America. 
So looking at Brazil, massive country, lots of people, many big cities. Brasilia is the capital. Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo, though, are the you know mega cities. Uh, and so um, Rio uh, is Christ the Redeemer, that statue looking down on the city. Now the next picture that I'm going to show you is actually see uh, this here, this little mountaintop that's lit up. There's a cable car that comes up to it. And this next picture is looking back where Christ the Redeemer is in the distance. So Christ the Redeemer is actually, see that up there? So if you're actually in the city, the statue is like right in the distance. Uh, so this is, yeah, so I'll just go back. So that little mountain there with the light, that's where the cable car goes up to. And this is looking back with the statue right in the distance. And then you can see Rio down there. Now some people say that the Rio has got the best beaches in the world. I disagree as a Whit Sunday boy and um, Whitehaven Beach is definitely, I've never been to Rio, but I'm just going to tell you as a fact uh, <laughs> that it is not better than uh, Whitehaven Beach and the Whit Sundays. Not, no bias there at all. Completely objective. Uh, so, Rio's carnival, uh, it's famous for, and um, <laughs> it's actually quite hard. Uh, if you ever do a search for uh, Rio carnival images, it's actually quite hard to find a picture that is not going to be offensive to anyone, where people are <laughs> actually fully clothed and, you know, just having a good time. Because, yeah, people tend to wear a lot less than those uh, guys. So here's some of the performers. Again, it's quite hard to find, you know, a non-objectionable sort of... Um, images, so famous for its carnival. Uh, yeah. Rio also has tremendous poverty, so the favelas or slums uh, are massive uh, and a huge crime problem. So here's an image of police going into some of the favelas where essentially there's been, yeah, the crime gangs uh, rule. Uh, there was huge, in the lead up to uh, the Olympics in Rio and also the World Cup, the, the government tried to clamp down on the favelas, so there was a huge amount of effort in police and clamping down on the huge crime in Rio. So it's a beautiful city in many ways. It's also got some of the worst things of human society. So yeah, this is just a story from police invading the Rio slums um, in cleanup for the world stage. So. This city, in 1992, hosted, at that stage, the biggest gathering of world leaders focused on environmental issues ever. And, yeah, this is just some images from it. So the, in June of 1992. And this is an image looking back. So different uh, representatives of the countries there and what's a, a plenary session. So listening in, you can see their headphones on. So, you know, these UN conferences have a huge effort in translation to, you know, dozens or hundreds of different languages occurring as a speaker speaks. Translation is occurring in real time. Okay, so the key documents agreed at the Rio conference, as it's known, or the Earth Summit in 1992, was the Rio Declaration. So it's... You know, you, you can hear, you can see from the name that it's a non-binding, what's often called soft law. So hard law, when we talk about it in terms of international environmental regulation, hard law are the things that impose binding obligations that you sign up to and you've got things that are enforceable and that sort of stuff. So something like the, um, you know, the Montreal Protocol or something like that, you know, hard laws, as opposed to soft laws which tend to be sort of statements that are non-binding uh, and not enforceable as such. So what's the value of soft laws, do you think? Like, why have them? That's a great point. Uh, reference point in ethical standards. Anyone else? What's the value of soft laws, a document like the Rio Declaration? Kind of both persuasion, but also like communication on... Like Absolutely fantastic. Persuasion and communication, yep, so goal setting. 
And even though they're not technically enforceable, they have tremendous persuasive power. And often governments have talked before about how you know, most governments want to be seen to be a good international citizen. So if the global community has committed to a particular goal, like the Sustainable Development Goals now, so the Sustainable Development Goals are just a resolution of the UN, but they're very powerful as, is in terms of overall in international policy and governments working towards them. So even though they're not bound, just as you, know, you and I, we want to be seen by our friends to be a you know, good member of the community, a good friend, so most countries want to be seen to be a good, upstanding member of the community, the international community. So it's very persuasive. And so something like the Rio Declaration, it still is valuable for policy setting and the like around the world. Agenda 21 was a detailed document trying to set out how sustainable development would actually be operationalized. It was, again, soft law, uh, and but a detailed uh, plan for sustainable development. Largely since then it's been largely ignored but it's, it's still an important reference point. In terms of you know your research papers if you want to look at sustainable development sort of issues like air pollution in a you know sort of a, a context or something that doesn't really fit easily within one of the major international conventions then sustainable development gives you a lot of scope for dealing with you know anything related to you know society or human you know human health effects those sorts of things if they're more interest if you're more interested in that but I wouldn't make your reference point agenda 21 the much more topical and timely thing to look at are the sustainable development goals that we'll look at tomorrow or briefly in uh, tomorrow's lecture but Agenda 21 was essentially a, a detailed blueprint for how, we, how the world would operationalise sustainable development. The forest principles, I'll um, mention them in a few slides, but essentially they, the global community couldn't agree on, they were trying to negotiate and agree on binding treaties dealing with uh, forestry and logging of you know, countries like, you know, we've looked at... Um, Indonesia and the you know massive destruction for palm oil so the global community was trying to agree on a framework dealing with uh, forestry they couldn't so instead of getting a convention they developed a non-binding soft law document commonly called the forest principles they could agree on the convention on biological diversity uh, which was signed in 1992, and also the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Convention on Biological Diversity really overlaps in many ways with things like the Ramsar Convention, the World Heritage Convention, all of the CITES, these things that have come before and still exist. The Convention on Biological Diversity just is more overarching, uh, but yeah, in its obligations are vague in many ways, and, and those other regimes are still very important. Okay, so the Rio Declaration in 1992, I, I don't, you know, the, a number of principles similar to the Stockholm Declaration talking about, you know, generally start, I'll, I will look at it. Um, well, the, that link seems, anyway. I won't get hung up on... Hmm, I didn't like that link at all. Basically a declaration similar to the Stockholm uh, Declaration in 1972, but a little bit more advanced, still talking about, you know, recognising humanity's right to uh, develop uh, and to use resources, so particularly from African countries. Uh, there's a very strong emphasis on, you know, our ability to use the environment. We don't see it as separate, you know, that we're just going to protect nature, that, you know, our, our communities are part of, you know, the world around us and we use it. So there's always a very uh, strong recognition of human human humanity's right to use the world around them, uh, but also an emphasis on sustainability and uh, those issues. 
So that's the soft law declaration. Agenda 21, as I've already explained, a um, fairly large document with a detailed blueprint built around sustain um, sustainable development and particularly even down to the lo local government level. So a lot of local governments around the world you know, tried to use Agenda 21 to, as a, a blueprint, uh, largely, largely dissipated. You know, there was some energy for that uh, in the 1990s, but uh, there's still some crazy uh, US, um, you know, like if you do a search for Agenda 21, like a Google search, Websites that will pop up basically are this sort of crazy conspiracy theory in the US about Agenda 21 being some global plan to take over the world and overthrow freedom and democracy. And, and so if you're doing a search for Agenda 21, there's a whole heap of this conspiracy stuff. But it really petered out. And the sustainable development goals now are much more the current uh, blueprint for sustainability. Uh, so I wouldn't get you know, wouldn't be worried about, you know, spending too much time thinking about Agenda 21, but it's still an important part of the development of our, you know, of how we get to now. And I mentioned the forest principles. This is a non-legally binding, <laughs> it's a bit of a um, uh, contradictory, isn't it? It's non-legally binding but authoritative statement of principles for a global consensus on the management, conservation and sustainable development of all types of forests. So as I say, they were trying for a convention but just couldn't get agreement, particularly from say countries that have a lot of forests, uh, say Indonesia and the like, who wanted to continue to use them and wouldn't agree to constrain their use of them. There, there, it, there were also later uh, agreements. So there was the later International Tropical Timber Agreement in 1994. It doesn't um, expressly include temperate forests, though. But you know that's another convention that has uh, is in place. But yeah, I just mentioned that. I also just would also would just mention the um, convention to combat um, desertification. This is an important convention in a number of countries, in particularly um, uh, African countries, but also uh, China. I've seen a, had a number of students from China who've, you know, because I'd never really thought about it from an Australian perspective. It's something that we don't really emphasise in Australia. But the students I've had from China have talked about how significant it is uh, for, for them for uh, essentially the loss of agricultural land and, and increase in deserts. So trying to avoid loss of agricultural land to, to deserts and you know, very, very significant in parts of China that are affected by that. So efforts to try and addre address um, desertification, particularly Africa uh, and some other countries like China. So yeah, it's also a large tree. I don't, you know, I just mention it. Um, in passing, but without going into details of it. And the website's there if you want to go and have a explore. As I said, some students in the past have used that as their research, you know, their research topics, and you're, you're welcome to if that's something that you're interested in. The Division, sorry, the Commission on Sustainable Development was also established uh, and, you know, was important, is an important part of the UN. Um, the, Convention, though, that I want to focus on for this lecture is the Convention on Biological Diversity, 1992. It's got a great website. Uh, its current executive secretary of the Secretariat is Christina Palmer, Pasca Palmer. She was appointed a couple of years ago. She was previously the Romanian Minister for the Environment. And yeah, she's one of those great UN people, you know, fluent in a number of languages. Um, and great to see, you know, uh, great women taking these leadership roles. It's such an important, um, so important for us globally that um, you know women uh, have these uh, leadership roles and push out the old white crusty guys like me. So uh, you can find the treaty on um, the CBD website. I only want to really emphasise Article Eight because that's the, you know, skip over the definition section, all of that stuff, just focus on a couple of the key obligations. So Article 8, in situ conservation, and notice that 
typesetting of this. So this is back in 1992. The old was typed on, an, on a real typewriter. They didn't have uh, Times New Roman font um, that you could choose in Word. It just didn't exist. Uh, it was yeah typed out on a typewriter. So the original version, in, Article 8, in situ conservation. Each contracting party shall, as far as possible and as appropriate, so heavily qualified, you know, basically it's up to you how far you go with this, it's up to you. While that's weak, it's also essential to then get countries to sign on. So, A, establish a system of protected areas or areas where special measures need to be taken to conserve biological diversity. So many countries already had that in 1992. So the US had led under Roosevelt, had led the world in establishing national parks, and a lot of countries had copied that. In Australia, we copied that. I think our first national park was Royal National Park, just south of Sydney. Massive, beautiful national park in coastal regions. And it came only a couple of years after the US established its first national park, which was Yosemite or was it Yellowstone? Okay, Yellowstone closely followed by Yosemite. So Australia copied that. And then w up here in Queensland, we also copied that. Lamington, I think, was declared a national park in 1909 or something. Like it was only a few years after the US. So many countries already had protected areas. Uh, and B. Um, develop where necessary guidelines for the selection, establishment and management of protected areas. So, okay, so many countries are signing up to something that they've already got. Uh, C, regulate or manage biological resources important for the conservation of biological diversity, whether within or outside protected areas with a view to ensuring their conservation and sustainable use. Notice that that's an important. We've gone from just protected areas to also outside. So you're covering everything because in a country or in a state like Queensland, our terrestrial ecosystems, does anyone know how much of Queensland, the land, is in within national parks and protected areas? Sorry? Eight to nine percent? No, it's still around four percent, four or five percent. So you can look that up and correct me if you, sorry? Okay, well, um, find me a, if you could, give me a reference for that. Uh, so, I think it will depend on how protected areas are defined. I th I'm pretty sure that national parks is still only... Anyway, let's have a look at it. Protected areas of the whole of Queensland. I'd love to see that yeah, figure. But even at 8%, you're still looking at the majority of Queensland is not within protected areas. And so, it's important that if we're going to conserve biodiversity, it's not just protected areas. Yes? You notice that I defined it carefully as terrestrial protected areas. So, and even then, when you look at the Great Barrier Reef, yes, it's all a protected area, but it's a multi-use park. So there are many parts of it that are general use. So allows fishing. It's prohibited within that, though, that you can um, uh, develop oil and gas, but fishing is allowed. So it's more complicated. And in a couple of slides, I'll talk about the different categories of protected areas. So. Protected area management is, again, it's not just a black and white exercise. Uh, but importantly here, we're looking at obligations outside protected areas. Yes. Good. So 4.72%. So and that's just national parks. Just national parks, okay. Hold protected areas, yeah. So I'm wondering what's the other 4%. They're probably going to include forest areas because there was a big push under Isla Quito a few years ago we were going to transfer all of our native forests into national parks and that led to a big blowback we were going to massively increase our national park system uh, so we yeah anyway at four or eight percent it's still you know yeah yeah so Queensland's the lowest of all of the states um, the key thing is protected areas alone won't conserve your biodiversity. You've also got to do a lot of other things. Okay, so that's C. D, promote the protection of ecosystems, natural habitats, and the maintenance of viable populations of species in natural surroundings. D just blows it out of the water. And D is the really critical one because what's known as uh, essentially the ecosystem approach, that's what is so valuable in the biodiversity convention because 
Okay, so, so before we had a lot of protected area frameworks like the World Heritage Convention is basically a protected area framework. The Ramsar Convention is basically a protected area framework. Uh, then we've also got species centric things like the like CITES uh, and um, y you've, you've got sort of other broad things for the marine environment under UNCLOS. So there was a broad obligation to protect the marine environment but the CBD spans all of those because it doesn't just cover the land, it also covers the oceans. And now we're talking about an ecosystem approach. So, f so it goes beyond even UNCLOS because uh, UNCLOS, as we saw, reached up into preventing land source marine pollution. So something like um, the pollution coming out of the Mississippi River could be, you know, could be addressed under provisions for UNCLOS. But now we've also got biodiversity on land and you know, migratory species all under the one umbrella. So an ecosystem approach. And then E, promote environmentally sound and sustainable development in areas adjacent to protected areas. Um, and K, develop, and develop or maintain necessary legislation and other regulatory provisions for the protection of threatened species and populations. So a legal element there. So, Article 8 is, you know, the big ticket item. In terms of, um, you know, thinking about the CBD, I, I don't generally want you to be aware of provisions, individual provisions, but Article 8 is a good one to, to actually be aware of because it is such an important standout and it created the ecosystem approach under the CBD. So the ecosystem approach, so in situ and ex situ, I'll just explain what that is. So. Uh, Latin, in situ, you can just basically think of as conservation in the wild, so in <coughs> situation, in the wild, in nature, whereas ex situ basically means in zoos or in other sort of, you know, uh, human controlled environments. So, yeah, you can think of in situ as in nature and ex situ as in a zoo. Uh, and Article, I think, 9 goes on to talk about ex situ conservation, but, you know, let's ecosystem approach in Article 8, that's the really big ticket item. So it deals with conservation inside and outside of protected areas and all species and ecosystems and includes terrestrial and marine eco ecosystems. So this is comprehensive. And I just wanted to mention the IUCN protected area <coughs> categories and I've already talked about the IUCN red list, I oh, know. So the IUCN protected area categories one to six basically recognize that protected areas come from in a range of levels of, of protection. Everything from areas that might even exclude humans, like purely scientific you know, research areas where there's no use, no human use is allowed, through to areas the lowest levels really only limit or restrict um, mineral and gas uh, development. So there's a range of categories for protected areas that are recognized at an IUCN level. It's so, sim so that's why you know, we, we might talk about something like a national park, but classically a national park uh, is about the protection and conservation of nature and doesn't generally allow human uses to continue. Whereas something like the uh, Great Barrier Reef is managed in what are called multiple use zones, so zoning, so that some areas allow fishing, some areas allow, um, you know, don't allow any fishing to occur. Uh, in the whole area, it's still a protected area though, even though it allows fishing in many areas because um, within it, marine, sorry, um, mining and gas exploration and development are prohibited. So it's still a protected area, but you know, it's not just simply a black and white protected versus, protected area covers lots of things, uh, more than just exclusion of human impacts. Okay, and I found this book really fascinating. A friend of mine actually is this fellow, Tim Lowe. He's a wonderful Australian writer and naturalist. He's written many books. Um, New Nature was one of the ones that I found most um, insightful and developed at least my understanding because when we think about, well, what is nature and what is biodiversity, he makes the point in this book that nature is more opportunistic than we think. Animals aren't fixed in their ways and they will exploit the opportunities that we provide. 
and nature is not a separate domain hiding away in the wilderness. Animals and plants live all around us and exploit us when they can. And just go look around Brisbane, you know, has anyone got a possum problem? So possums, you know, doing pretty well in an urban environment, even though you'll see them pretty regularly splattered on a road. Uh, the number of times you'll hear on your roof at night and you go, oh, what the hell is that? And it's a possum running across your roof. Uh, or, you know, the like, you know, you see them up in the power poles. And similarly, birds like ibis, you know, those big white birds that, um, you know, are quite pests. Uh, there's, you know, flocks of them and they particularly come into rubbish bins and that sort of stuff. In, in um, You don't really see them around... Uh, South Bank anymore, but they were quite a problem around South Bank, and I think they had a program with going and um, shooting them with dyes or something. I, there was a program to get rid of them, but not just kill them. But anyway, ibis, possums, cane toads, for instance, you know, they are, you know, humans have introduced them, they're an exotic species into Australia, and they're a huge pest, but they're exploiting the environment that they found that we introduced them to. So, um, Nature isn't just out there, you know, in like Springbrook National Park. Uh, nature is all around us. When you walk outside and you see a bird, that's part of nature. It's part of an artificial, you know, modified environment from humans. But, you know, humans are part of nature and our, the environments we've created. So many environments are heavily modified. I've mentioned Carbill Hinchinbrook in earlier lectures, but this is just an example from the Queensland coast uh, where if you look at that image on the left, uh, the pink purple areas are all the lowland, what have all been cleared for sugarcane basically, other than there's a few swampy marshy areas on the coast that are part of Edmund Kennedy National Park that basically they got into national parks before they got to being drained. Uh, but if you then look at mapping of that area, which is on the right, uh, all of the settlement patterns and all of the land ownership is all of that grey area is freehold land and the like and then all of the areas in the mountains are all national parks but basically all of the lowlands have been cleared and are a freehold land and developed heavily developed and then it, the only thing that the only reason why there's those national parks is basically because it was too steep to plant sugarcane on so they were used for forestry uh, and then when forestry ended in them they would turn back into national parks. But, you know, often what's left is just the vestige of what we haven't already, you know, converted. So, yeah, Kabul Hinterbrook region illustrates the reality that globally protected areas are disproportionately found in higher, steeper, and remote areas. We often would put things in national parks that were beautiful to us, you know, like if there's a beautiful waterfall or this mountaintop or something, and you couldn't farm it anyway. You know, then putting it in a national park and making it like a this attractive area that we protected, all well and good, but a lot of biodiversity is found in you know areas that were flat and you know uh, rich for farming, and we cleared all those areas largely and converted them to farmland. So yeah, um, in many countries, though not all, there's a bias to locate protected areas in land that's not suitable for agriculture. So, and I mentioned that there's different levels of protection in place like the Great Barrier Reef. So this, it's, the GBR is often held up as a international benchmark for multiple use uh, marine park planning. So it's got a zoning plan where different areas are designated. The green areas are uh, no fishing. The blue areas are different levels of allowing fishing. And so this is just a table that converts across those areas to what you can do for in terms of like if you want to go into the GVR and fish somewhere you can get these maps and this is where they translate what the maps mean into terms that a normal person can understand so if you're going to if you're going into a light blue area the general use zone then can you see there um, bait netting is allowed boating diving photography is allowed it's got a tick crabbing is allowed uh, and then if we go down to um, this line fishing, it's got a tick. But then if you come across into a green zone, see it's got a cross. So this is a, the green zones or no fishing areas. So if I go back here, this is just off Carbill Hinchinbrook, around, say, Hinchinbrook Island here. See how there's areas that are allowed for fishing, 
and then the green zones are the no fishing areas. So if you go fishing there, basically you can get a significant fine. So that's multiple use marine park planning. Okay, the CBD often is often he heavily criticised. This is just an extract from, um, yeah, an article by Rachel Adams saying, um, it's understandable that governments do not want to contend with the root causes of biodiversity loss as it entails changing the status quo for special interest groups, a potentially a politically dangerous step. Thus, instead of undertaking critically necessary measures to contend with these underlying factors, governments have preferred to create a myth of action to address biodiversity loss by adopting weak agreements of dubious effectiveness. The CBD is an example of this myth in action. It addresses the symptoms or indicators um, of biodiversity loss such as ecosystem degradation and species extinction, but not the underlying drivers such as high population growth, even greater economic growth, together with the misuse of fossil fuels as a primary energy source, overconsumption, growing food demand and overwhelming poverty. Hard to um, fight back against. That's a powerful critique and, yeah, many, ac you know, accurate. There's also one of the problems with the CBD is the lack of clear links to climate change and, yeah, this is just a blog from a few years ago. Don't mention the C word. It's the UN Biodiversity Conference. So you go to the, one of these conferences, they don't talk about climate change because the tacit agreement is we'll leave climate to be dealt with under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Similarly, under the World Heritage Convention and the Ramsar Convention, climate change is a huge threat to the things protected under them, but they tend not to deal with climate change because they leave that to the UNFCCC. So even though climate change is a clear threat to coral reefs globally, the World Heritage Committee, at least at this stage, is refusing to enter coral reefs on the list of World Heritage in Danger because essentially if they did that, they would have to list every World Heritage site that has coral reefs. Like you'd enter them all, because they are all severely threatened by climate change. So there's this fake breaking up of the problems into different regimes. Um, just on the point of poverty versus conservative biodiversity, I've already talked about this in earlier lectures, but you know, we've got this oppressive, you know, huge poverty in many parts of the world. Here's from um, Mumbai and in India, tremendous slums, you know, is reducing poverty versus conserving biodiversity, you know, it's often put up as, you know, jobs versus environment, but made the point, it's a false dichotomy. Um, economy versus conserving biodiversity is a false dichotomy because we want jobs, we want all of these outcomes we've talked about earlier. Protecting the environment is critical to that. It's the foundation of it. It's the taproot of everything that we've got. So it's not a choice of either or. We've actually got to do both. And if you, you know, kill this tree by, you know, if you cut the root of this tree, you're going to kill it. You know, there are not going to be any jobs. As often said, you know, there's no jobs on a dead planet. So, yeah, there's a lot of threats to biodiversity. We've talked uh, already about um, Borneo and the clearing of forests for palm oil, talked about that in the context of trade. I want to use a different example though, just briefly now, and that's the one that's hugely in the news at the moment, um, has been for a long time, but right now there's incredible destruction in the Amazon. Um, so the destruction of the Amazon rainforest is incredible, doing incredible damage to biodiversity globally. So you know where the Amazon is, South America, massive river system, the Amazon basin shown there. And yeah, a whole range of rivers leading into that. The Amazon is the main one, but you know, there's major rivers coming into that. I'm gonna talk about the, a little bit about the um, Tepeos River, I think is how it's pronounced. I can't really do the Portuguese pronunciation very well. Um, way up in the Amazon um, in Ecuador, this is Yusini National Park, so incredible beauty. And here's in another incredible um, you know, place of incredible beauty. And yeah, lots of people within the Amazon basin, so some floating houses there on the Amazon River in Peru, 
And yeah, it's this incredible river system that's intricate. Here's the river mouth, massive and filled with incredible biodiversity. So here we've got a um, ocelot and a pygmy marmoset. Pretty cool. Imagine, you know, like some people might think you have a bad hair day, but, you know, if you're a pygmy marmoset, then, you know, you really know a bad hair day. Um, poison, sorry, the blue poison arrow frog. Um, or, you know, if anyone, has anyone seen Rio 2, that cartoon movie, a kid's movie? Anyway, there's a um, frog in it that thinks it's a poison, uh, blue poison arrow frog. It turns out she's actually not, uh, and that leads to a happy ending for her. She can finally hug the um, cockatoo that she's in love with and won't kill him by the end. Okay, incredible biodiversity, um, the scarlet macaw and jaguar. Um, yeah, these amazing river dolphins and a lot of threats to it. So logging in Brazil, um, areas cleared for soybean. So I'm sure everyone knows the story. So there's a lot of uh, clearing going on there for to so clear the forest, you get the timber, but then you also farm it and particularly growing things like soybean. So not just for feeding vegetarians, but what is, what a, lot, what is a lot of the soybean used for? It's not just for making tofu. Cattle, yeah, and pig feed. So a lot of the soybean that is farmed in Brazil goes to the US and is used in intensive feedlots. The US and I'm sure countries like China. So, and we use them in intensive feedlots to grow pigs and cattle particularly, and then you know, ending up as a steak or you know, a, on a McDonald's hamburger. So a lot of that meat comes from effectively from the Amazon um, and soybean. So yeah, incredible destruction, basically feeding that particularly meat-based diet, uh, not just in the US, but globally. So yeah, loss of it. And basically uh, for, I'm gonna just show you, I'm gonna jump to some uh, images of this year, because it's been incredibly in the news, but I also wanna just do some, some images from like the last decade to show you that uh, this isn't just something that's recently happened, this is an ongoing, catastrophe. So what's often called the ring of fire, basically the loss within the Amazon basin pushing in further and further and deeper and deeper. So in yellow is the deforestation up to 1997 and then the red was deforestation from 1998 to 2006. And yeah, deforested by 2006, you can just see this ring sort of coming in and you can see it moving up from the south particularly, so what's yeah, often called the ring of fire because fire is used, the, or the arc of destruction. Um, fire is used extensively to first clear the forest and then you know, go in and you might take timber from it, but essentially then you, you might also just clear fell it. So Mato Grosso is one of the states in uh, Brazil that's where some of the highest rates of forestry occurs. So here's some satellite imagery from Mato Grosso and you can see the clearing. Um, and this is just from an article about um, deforestation of cropland agriculture in, in Mato Grosso. So extensive, pervasive transition of the Brazilian land use system. This is from an article from 2014. Again, just emphasizing this isn't something that's just happened. It's something that is ongoing. And I'll jump through this because I want to get to a couple of things. One is the new hydro, or the new schemes that are um, proposed at the moment. One of the consequences of China's expansion is that it is pumping money into countries like Brazil for huge development. So in, there's a proposal for a mega hydro plan. This is from an article from 2017. The Brazilian government wants to open up the Tapeas River Basin, an area the size of France, for tr trade with China. Um, but the indigenous uh, people won't let it happen without a fight. And there's the Tapeas River. Does anyone speak Portuguese and can pronounce that better than me? So apologies for anyone who speaks Portuguese listening to this recording that I'm butchering it. But Tapeas River. Uh, that comes off the um, Amazon, you can see it marked there again in a Google Earth image and that's uh, it from a, that news report and essentially what uh, they want to do is 
do a series of dams along that that will flood the river and then provide um, hydropower. There's a planned railway, um, yeah, a series of dams, massive, um, yeah, so the Brazilian government plans to turn the river into the world's biggest grain canal by building 49 dams on its tributaries. And this isn't like in the 1960s, this is right now. And it's not just, you know, fires and burning, this is a massive mega agricultural development right in the heart of the Amazon. Um, and fully with the, you know, not just the full support, but instigated by the Brazilian government. So, so here's an image of, uh, from an, an article about that and, you know, the, what's already been done at one of the dam sites. And yeah, essentially the indigenous people have been fiercely opposed to it, but essentially they're being pushed off by the police uh, and basically just deprived of their land. So it's an incredibly sad story happening right now. And that, okay, so that was 2017. The situation was pretty dire and pretty bad. And then the situation just got a lot worse with the election of this extremely right-wing um, uh, president, um, Bolsonaro, who basically his policies are hugely anti any indigenous people and the protection of their lands and absolutely pro development of everything uh, and yeah basically uh, in this last um, year has been uh, extremely vocal in any sort of international concerns raised about the destruction that is ramped up under his uh, government and there's this series of images uh, this was a fantastic article from uh, just earlier this month on ABC where you can see from space clearly the human impact and I'm just going to take you through it because it's one of those articles where as you move down it sort of changes. So the sheer size of the Amazon and those fires that have engulfed it could be hard to comprehend but from far up you can start to get a better sense of the scale. The Amazon rainforest, which is often referred to as the Earth's lungs, covers an area of 5.7 million square kilometres. And between January and the end of July this year, data from Brazil's National Institute for Space Research shows uh, almost 16,000 active fire hotspots had been detected within the Amazon biome. Just one month later, that figure had almost tripled to more than 46,000 fires. The fire season was so was so far the worst in almost a decade. Agricultural fires like this one um, were being lit all around the edges of the rainforest. Uh, and as more fire, more and more fires flared up, thick plumes of smoke began pouring from the Amazon into the air and unusual weather systems carried the smoke to Brazil's coast and at 3 p.m. on August 9 the plume mixed with thick clouds over San Paulo turning day into night and drawing global attention to the fires burning in the Amazon so that's 3 p.m. in San Paulo sparked outrage because the fire was not a natural part of the Amazon's ecosystem yeah basically Many of the tens of thousands of fires that were detected in the Amazon in August were lit by farmers. Uh, yeah, and you can see many, many of the fires appear to be in the edge of the rainforest. That's because fire is often used to burn through newly felled forests that have been cleared to make way for pastures. It's a technique known as slash and burn. And the pastures are then allowed to grow for a few years before being burned again to boost the nutrients in the soil. And that's this is why the fires and deforestation are intertwined in the Amazon. It's a relationship that's clearly visible in the satellite data. Yeah, and that's an image of um, the areas where the rainforest has recently been felled or cleared, and it matches almost perfectly with the location of this year's fires. So just look at that image for a moment, just to think of the scale like tens and tens of thousands of fires happening and you know this this is you know this year so yeah an incredible loss of biodiversity incredible impacts 
deforestation rates in the Amazon since 1988. So, yeah, it was bigger um, in terms of area cleared back in the 2004, but it's still, you know, massive. So it's going to spike up in 2019. Yep, yeah, and the president, when he became president last year, um, has rolled back protections, cut funding to Brazil's National Environment Agency, issued fewer penalties for illegal deforestation. His governor sacked the head of Brazil's space agency after it reported a sharp rise in deforestation rates. He's been attacking law enforcement agents in the media. Um, even before he came into office, he conveyed a message of um, a wild west for the Amazon and the progress is to be pushed the commodities frontier deeper into the forest. So basically said, go, go for it. We're not going to prosecute you, even if you kill local people. Uh, so foresters, there's been reports of, you know, local people standing up to the foresters and just being murdered. Um, and as the fires drew international attention, the Brazilian government also banned the use of fire. So there was some responses to it, but basically the president has told, you know, countries that called, you know, I think it was Germany was concerned and tried to offer some money to help deal with it and he called it neo-colonialism. So, you know, it's difficult for the, say, European countries and others who are concerned about these issues if they raise it, they're called, you know, because obviously there's a tremendous legacy of colonial destruction in many parts of the world, including South America. So the president is playing on that you know history and sentiment and saying get stuff this is our country we'll develop it as we want um, yeah and the fire count in the Amazon has been enormous one of the professors said he felt resigned I've been working closely with such fires for 25 years in this region and others this is a very serious and destructive problem but global attention is only present when the fire impacts major cities and yeah it's really difficult to see how we are going to to address that I don't I don't know that there's any answer like if the country itself wants to destroy those things then there's little that the international community can do uh, I want to give you, though, an example about fighting and also that biodiversity isn't just about protecting cute and cuddly things. So this was a case that I was involved in um, back a long time ago now. It was about killing flying foxes in North Queensland and it involved um, mass culling of flying foxes by uh, farmers in an area of North Queensland and this is some footage that a client of mine, Cara Booth, took. So she went onto the land, and she went onto the land because she knew that the regulators wouldn't be keen to take action against farmers. So she went on and she filmed what she we saw. So what the farmers had done is build this electric grid above the lychee. You know, lychees is these fruit that you can eat, really nice. The little black dots you can see there are dead bats. So they put this electric, electrified grid above the lychees so the bats coming in at night can't see the wires collide with them and are electrocuted. Uh, and yeah, Carol basically did a survey and over several days established that they were killing between 500 and... 600 bats per night over a six to eight week lychee season when you multiply that out if you assume a constant kill rate it was something like 10 to 30,000 bats over a single lychee season of six to eight weeks in yeah so they just were finding hundreds of these dead bats and um, yeah it was horrific uh, so Carol went to Carol Booth, um, it's not her that you hear speaking, but she was with um, this man as they were basically walking around and surveying it. They took this footage to the state and federal regulators to say, this is going on, you need to stop it. The flying foxes are protected at a state level under the Nature Conservation Act. 
They were part of the wet tropics World Heritage Area, so or coming out of a World Heritage Area, so they were protected under federal environment laws. This is under night vision. So they had this evidence of these bats being killed. They had this evidence of all these bats being killed. They went to the environment regulators. This was unlawful. What do you think was the response from the state and federal environment regulators? It probably said that, but in terms of stopping this farmer doing this, what action do you think they took? Nothing. In fact, one of the state regulators went out uh, and um, purported to issue the farmer with a retrospective permit to try and make it lawful what he was doing, gave him a permit to kill 500 flying foxes in the season and tried to make it retrospective. Carol's response to that was, well, that's unlawful, you can't do that, but even if you can, He's killing that number every night or every second night, like 500 didn't actually cover it, but that was the sort of measures that were taken. So why do you think a regulator would do that? Because of the agricultural lobby, yeah. The, the power of um, the farming lobby in uh, Australia is really significant and essentially they were captured. Uh, you know, there's this concept of regulatory capture in, in, in terms of uh, regulatory theory. It's the idea where regulators, um, not just corruption where they're being paid money, but corruption in that you effectively stop enforcing the law against the regulated community. So it's a huge problem for governments because often industry people move from, you know, often people employed by government have been previously employed by industry and people who have been employed by government go to industry, so the revolving door syndrome. So uh, often, even at an enforcement officer level, their ideas might align with thinking, well, farmers should be allowed to do what they want on the land, and these laws that we've got, we shouldn't really enforce them. So particularly in relation to like natural resources enforcement officers, that's been a huge cultural issue to overcome. So. Yeah, a lot of footage there, and you can just see the extent of it. So this massive, massive farm. So Carol um, decided that it wasn't good enough just to basically leave it. Uh, so she decided to go to court. Uh, so we went to the federal court here in Brisbane and sought an injunction to restrain the operation of these grids. and. She risked, in doing that, she risked bankruptcy, uh, but she decided to take that risk. Uh, so she went to court, and I think we're going to see a little bit of Carol in a moment. So that's a dead, they're called spectacle flying foxes. They've got a bit of gold around their eyes that makes them look like they're wearing spectacles. Here's a young, that, so at that time of year they fly with young on them, so the mother's been killed and the young is there would have either been killed by the farmers or died of thirst. And this is Carol Booth. So flying foxes, so this is a spectacle flying fox, they look like they've got a, they've got a gold tuft of um, fur around their eyes and they've got a gold tuft on the back of their neck. They're only found in, well they're endemic to the wet tropics world heritage area so you won't see them like flying foxes you see down here in Brisbane are either greyheads or blacks or little reds. They're not found this far south. They're really cool uh, and they're quite big. 
Um, so flying foxes, you, do you know, everyone knows that bats, there's two big types of bats. There's the microchoroptera, which are the small bats that eat insects, so the little ones that flit around, have echolocation, that sort of stuff. Then there's the big bats, big bats, the megachoroptera, that eat fruit and blossom. They're vegetarians. They don't eat insects, and they basically have the same hearing as you or I. They've got much better eyesight, though, and a much better sense of smell than you and I, and they're basically looking for fruit, blossom, and they're really important for pollination and seed dispersal. Uh, just like bees, you know, go from flower to flower. Everyone knows the story of the birds and the bees. Well, here you've got a spectacle flying fox eating some blossom and getting covered in pollen. So then it flies to another tree that's in flower at the same time. And the pol pollen that's all over its fur gets deposited on the next flower. And so it pollinates um, the tree. <coughs> so the Lychee Farm was in the southern part of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, so uh, all, of the, all around it was fully protected areas, national parks, but the flying foxes were coming out of the forest to feed on lychees. Um, and basically any of the big fruit that hang from trees are classically dispersed by flying foxes. Anything hanging from trees that's pungent is a, so what are those sorts of fruit? What's big and smelly and hangs from trees? So light cheese, sorry? Mangoes, yes. Mangoes is the, you know, beautiful this time of year, but mangoes, they're a classic, they're, they're screaming out to mammals like you or I, but particularly flying foxes to come in, eat me, and then they're taking, uh, is from the, the like if you, when you eat the mango, why is the tree giving you all that flesh? Like, is the flesh any use to it for growing the next generation? Why is there a mango? You know, in the middle of the mango is the seed. So the flesh is the thing we eat, and you normally throw the seed away. Why does the plant have all of that flesh? Yes, it's a bribe. It's a bribe for mammals. So we live in the age of the angiosperms, so the flowering plants, and they have done really well out of mammals particularly. So fruit is a bribe from a plant to a mammal, like us, to come in, you have the fruit and you disperse my seed. So next time, think of it this way, the next time you're eating a mango or an apple, like you, we like to think that we're in charge, um, you know, we eat the apple, but actually, We've been tricked by these plants. It's actually a cunning plan to get us to disperse them. And we think we're getting the best deal out of the, the plant. Uh, you know, we get to eat the fruit. But if you think about it from the plant's perspective, not only do we disperse the, f the seed, but we actually go and clear all its competitors. We, give it, we plant it. We give it nutrients. We give it water. We stop insects eating it. The plants are doing really well out of us. So it's this cunning plan. Next time you're eating fruit, you just think about that plant and how it's tricking you. So here was the lychee orchard, surrounded by national parks, flying foxes coming out of them. Uh, it was massive. I initially didn't think that we had any chance of proving, because we had to prove a significant impact on the World Heritage sites. And I happened to be up in the area um, the next week after Carol contacted me about it. And I stood on that, on there's a, um, the Bruce Highway runs just beside it and I stood and looked at this farm and there's this massive lychee farm and I thought holy mackerel this is big this is really big and so I called Carol um, pretty well from the car and said Carol I think we've got a case this is massive this is crazy how big this farm was it was the biggest lychee farm in North Queensland and yeah so the Wet Tropics was listed under the World Heritage Act in 1988 for its incredible biodiversity, including, uh, it was listed in terms of the criteria, it was listed for all of the four criteria for outstanding universal significance for natural heritage, including containing the most important and significant habitats, where threatened species of plants and animals of outstanding universal value from a point of view of science and conservation will su still survive. And in the listing documents, there's actually a picture of a spectacle flying fox. And the flying foxes are not only part of the biodiversity, but they're also, we can call them a keystone species. So they're critical for the survival of countless um, 
uh, tree species because they're critical for pollination and seed dispersal through the wet tropics. So if you lose them, you're not only going to lose that species, but you're going to, over time, you're going to lose a lot of other things. So anyway, Carol went on to run several other cases against lychee farms that had other grids. They were smaller. Um, this is a picture of her. Um, this guy, Merv Thomas, uh, where, yeah, he's standing in front of his lychee grid. He gave an interview with a radio station talking about his grids. Uh, Carol took him to court and ultimately the grids were cut down. I had to go back several times to with proceedings for contempt because he refused to recognise the court orders until finally faced with um, a big fine for ignoring the court, he cut the grids down. So there's the grid down. The lesson I want to draw from that is that conserving biodiversity is not just about saving cute and cuddly animals and it's not just about protected areas. So these animals were coming out of protected area onto private land and they were being killed there. Conserving biodiversity is also often hard and sometimes you need the courage and tenacity to fight long battles. So that litigation took us about five years so of concerted efforts until finally the government changed the law, banned electric grids and yeah, stopped their use uh, in the region. So also recognised from this the overlaps between the biodiversity conservation, the Convention on Biological Diversity and other treaties such as World Heritage. So that's the Convention on Biological Diversity. I just mentioned a couple of other things flow on from that before we take a break. So the World Summit on Sustainable Development. So 10 years after the Rio conference, there was another summit, this time in Johannesburg. And by this time, the global situation had changed. Notice the, the yeah, so there was 2002. So this is after September 11, 2001. So here's uh, a picture from the first plenary session, so where everyone comes together. And it was compared to the impetus and the push forward 10 years earlier in Rio. This was a complete, I wouldn't say disaster, but just the whole momentum for global action had dissipated. Uh, Colin Powell, who was the Secretary of State at the time, flew in gave a speech, flew out. It was, so I remember seeing news at the time about how insult, you know, basically the insult um, of it. But essentially the US at that time was focused on invading Iraq. So that was its almost 100% focus. So yeah, the, those September 11 attacks have had not only human, you know, direct human impacts and terrible consequences for human society in terms of the wars, but it also takes all the energy that we put into, you know, fighting terrorism and, you know, those issues and the global financial crisis all suck oxygen out of uh, addressing the biodiversity crisis as well as climate change. Um, fast forwarding, there was a 2010 biodiversity target um, to achieve by 2010 a significant reduction in the current rate of biodiversity loss. Um, so that was agreed in 2002. Do you think we achieved that? No. So we updated that in 2010 and now we've got the Arche biodiversity targets for 2020. So similar sort of targets. Um, do you think we're achieving it? On current trajectories, results suggest that despite accelerating policy and management responses, the impacts are likely to be outweighed by the threats. So the impacts of the efforts to address biodiversity uh, being outweighed. This is from an article from a few years ago where essentially the, these authors looked at the efforts to conserve biodiversity and then what the trends were and basically they found that there is increasing efforts to protect biodiversity but the trends are still bad and that's because essentially the threats, are, you know, the efforts are increasing but the threats are also increasing. So for instance, um, in the top left in A, they're looking at global effort in bottom trawling fishing, just massively increasing. And yeah, fish stocks therefore decreasing. So even though we've got increased effort in terms of marine protected areas and the like, it's not, we're still losing ground. So yeah, basically we're, we still are losing biodiversity hugely, uh, even though 
more effort is being made, um, we're still losing this battle. So yeah, I won't get stuck in that, but you know, we've got increased effort, but, but seemingly in, it's incongruous with that, that we are actually losing the battle. Okay, fast forward again to 2012, there was Rio plus 20. Again, it was a you know, disappointment compared with what had happened in 1992. So, um, yeah, we're failing to achieve the targets that have been set and we constantly now are actually backtracking, watering down our conservation efforts. So this is an article from 2018 about government experts say plan to prevent animal extinctions is failing and how we're watering down our conservation efforts. So um, last year there was a um, conference of the parties to the, um, so it was COP14, so you know these meetings are still occurring, there's ongoing reporting, there's ongoing efforts internationally to try and address this, but the bottom line is we're not being successful. And then, this was a Protected Planet report that I've mentioned to you, um, a, an evaluation framework that may be useful for your reports. I just wanted to mention uh, also in an inspiring context to the work of some past students on biodiversity conservation. I've mentioned Maria in the first lecture. She was from Mexico. This is a picture a selfie she took after she'd finished in this course. And she talked about, you know, hello, hola, Chris. How are things going for you? For me, uh, after seven months of looking for a job, I finally got one. And it's very well related to your course. My position is as an international cooperation specialist within Canambio, which is the National Commission for the Use and Knowledge of Biodiversity. I'll be looking at international agreements such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, CITES, etc., as well as trilateral and bilateral agreements. The next COP13 on the CBD will be held in Mexico, so it's a good opportunity to get involved in all those matters. I uh, won't be sitting around the office. In the next few months, um, I asked her if it was okay to you know, uh, share her information and a picture with the class. She said, that'd be great. Um, and anyway, she's by the time she responded to that, she'd moved job again and she was working in the Mayan tropical rainforest as a southeast uh, Mexico as a coordinator for the La Condon um, jungle for the Mesoamerica Biological Corridor, which sounds incredibly cool. So that's Maria, and yeah, coordinating federal government. So those are the sorts of things that, you know, I hope that many of you are involved in in the future, working for your governments on these sorts of initiatives, implementing international agreements. Uh, another past student, Josiane, was from Cameroon. This is, she worked on RED Plus, which we talk about in the context of climate change, so reduced emissions from deforestation and land degradation. Picture of her um, with some of the, so she's in the middle, in the black, uh, and uh, members of the community where she's looking at reforestation. You can see um, Josiane's in the purple um, top there. Um, yeah, working on RED Plus initiatives. So hope that you know you guys can be working on that in the future as well. So to wrap up, the Rio conference and the Earth Summit in 1992 was a, a landmark, uh, the high watermark really of uh, global momentum to address uh, environmental problems. Since then we've unfortunately seen a lot of black backsliding. Uh, the Rio Declaration was made then, the Agenda 21, we focused on the Convention on Biological Diversity in summary, I just want to emphasise the Earth Summit was a major milestone. It reflected global concerns uh, of the time. The treaty signed at 1992 established the major international frameworks to address biodiversity conservation and climate change in particular. And there was some soft, important soft law agreements. After 20 years, the worthy goals of those treaties remain largely unfulfilled and they would be unlikely to be agreed in the current international setting. However, they still remain important. And I also want to emphasise conserving biodiversity is not just about saving cute and cuddly animals and not just about protected areas. So conserving biodiversity is hard and sometimes you need the courage and tenacity to fight long battles. So I'm hoping that you guys are going to fight some long and successful battles in your careers. So in terms of further reading, you can have a look at the CBD website if you're interested in this topic. And that is the lecture. So it's 10 past 12. I, we're going to go on to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change next. Why don't we um, take lunch now, though? I know it's a lot of material. And I know 
it's you know jam packed in. So why don't we take a uh, hour for lunch and come back at uh, say quarter past one, and we'll dive into climate change. Does that sound good? Okay. Have a nice lunch. I'll see you soon.